Speaking of Courage Podcast, back in studio, new studio, almost done. What's up, Chase? Not a whole lot. Studio looks good, man. I like the flag. Yeah, yeah. So you are ju- you just celebrated your uh, Silver Star date? <laughs> so I don't tell you anything. <laughs> <laughs> I brag for you, dude. There you go, man. Yeah, September 12th, 2005. Yeah. It's uh, my unit. It's kind of our, our biggest action. So is it a date that's day, always like etched in your brain, or is it? Uh, sometimes. Well, I mean, when you notice what day it is, you kind of. Yeah. But it's, I mean, it was a long time ago, so, <laughs> you know. <laughs> you don't like to talk about it. <laughs> Not so much. Okay, where are we headed today? All right, man. We're uh, doing, so we, we've. Not that we're done with our local heroes, but we've gone through the uh, known Medal of Honor recipients that are from the area, so we're kind of branching out. So now we're going to be just doing some my personal favorites, I guess you could say. So we're going to talk about a a soldier by the name of J.R. McKinney in uh, World War II. What makes somebody your favorite? What do you look for? Or so what it's kind of a hard resonates. question to answer because I feel I don't want to feel yeah, like it's disrespectful to the oh this one's not my favorite. This one. Yeah, there's just certain ones like I said. I, there's there's certain things that key to me that I relate to. Infantry guys, army usually more than the Marines or the Navy or the yeah. Air Force. Things I can relate to. Um, I like the stories that are almost overcoming odds, I guess, or or sometimes you know not the big buff guy that everybody expected, but yeah, you know, a lot the of the smaller, smaller privates or the the people that you wouldn't have expected to rise to this greatness and somehow they have it inside them to have this this type of thing. So. Yeah. And then also, of course, the citations. Some of them are just, some of them are written well. They're real flowery. Who but writes them? Uh, the, whoever, so whoever submits them, like we've talked about, sometimes writes them poorly and then there'll be like an admin guy that's a clerk or something somewhere that'll, that'll actually spice them the, up a little spice bit. Spice them up. I don't want to say spice them up. Yeah. The, the facts no, happen or they yeah. didn't, but yeah. but yeah, you can have the same action written by two different people and one will be a bronze star and one will be a medal of honor. Just I, would, if the, uh, I listened to Jocko's, Jocko Willink's podcast yeah. and he had a, f- he, I think he had two guys under him that earned the medal of honor and he had to write some, I don't know if he it wrote the, the actual, honor. yeah, it was, uh, uh oh my gosh one of his guys was medal of honor he jumped okay. on a grenade navy seal oh michael Mansoor. there okay. you go okay. Mansoor. gotcha boom i didn't realize he was under him that's what i was gonna say there's yeah. only a couple of navy one of his guys that have, uh... and so he had to write something up i don't i know yeah. it's not a citation but right so it goes to, from to him the packet up the up. chain of command and everything okay. yeah and then somebody at the top writes the citation yeah well it's not at the top so they got to get i mean there's different processes different times and different places but yeah it's got to get approval and it's got to go it's got to get approved by you know regiment and then corps and division and then the whatever military branch it is army navy marine corps then it actually goes to like a committee that has uh, Medal of Honor recipients on there and other things, and they review it. And I mean, now they do whole forensic an- analysis and things like that. Wow, so, that's crazy. Yeah. So, what's our guy's name today? J.R. McKinney. J.R. John, it's R. John McKinney. McKinney, but they called him J.R. Okay. Country boy from Georgia. Army. He, Army. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Again, Army fought in the fought in the Pacific. It's actually he fought on Luzon, which is where he earned the uh, Medal of Honor, which is the same as Ismael Viegas which is the uh, retaking of the Philippines campaign. So okay. we've, we've actually talked about that a good amount yeah. on this uh, program. A lot of times the war in Europe overshadows the war in, Pacific, in the Pacific, and then the Marines' campaigns, you know, Iwo Jima and stuff like that, overshadow the Army's campaigns. Like I've been hearing so much more now just in passing right. about the Philippines and stuff. <laughs> I don't remember where I was watching the other day, but it was some show I was watching, and they had referred to that, and I was yeah. like, oh, wow. Yeah, see? So yeah. It's, it's, again, a hard-fought campaign, but it's it's not as well-remembered as some of the other battles, like Okinawa and Iwo Jima and things like that. But it's it was a long, extensive, exhausting high casualty campaign. Okay, so where was he born? Yeah, so McKinney's from Georgia. Um, one of the reasons I like his story, he reminds me a lot of Audie Murphy. We talk about uh-huh. Audie Murphy a lot. It's not really, you know, the Audie Murphy show, but just that that small country boy who grew up poor. So we talked about the Depression. We talked about what everybody that fought in World War II went through. McKinney would have went through those same things, but again, I think McKinney and his family were too poor to even notice there was a Depression. Um, right. He's from a small area in Georgia. He's born in 1921. His family's sharecroppers. Do you know what sharecroppers uh-uh. are? So sharecroppers are basically, not to get too off topic, but after the Civil War, those big plantations and stuff, they were broken yeah. up. So there'd still be a landowner who would have all the, um, own the property, and they would parcel up the land. And these guys, these farming families, they would basically be allowed to live on the, on the property. They'd have a small little shack or something like that. They would produce the crops and do everything, but they didn't get that. They'd get a small share. It was just basically subsidy living. They, they lived in crappy little houses. They, they eked out miserable lives. It was very poor. So they destitute. didn't own the land or They anything. didn't own the land. They didn't own the property. They were basically like allowed to live there. So they were kind of at the mercy of the, 
the bigger landowners. And so you like let that. someone live on your property and then they cater to the land? Yeah, but these are huge, like vast tracts of land. So there'd just be sharecropper shacks everywhere. And this in this area, I mean, this is up until the 1930s, they didn't even have electricity. So these guys are living in like dilapidated shacks with their families and no running water. No, probably some of them have running water. Some of them don't. They have the country stores and things like that. But it's this is where J.R. McKinney's from. And he's got four brothers and one sister. He's the second oldest brother, I think. Um, but he's just sickly young child, um, kind of a, like a, a soft hearted child, I guess you could say, yeah. but he, he grew up hunting. Family's poor. Um, brothers are toiling in the fields. They're picking cotton. They're, they're planting peanuts. They're doing all that hard work. And he's doing that as well. But when he's very young, he gets sick, he gets pneumonia and it's so bad that he's, he's basically going to die. So one of those country doctors has to come over and they literally just cut his back open and put a tube in his lung to keep him alive, to, to get that Dang. fluid out. And that ended up having big effects on him later in life because he was always sick and he was always weak because of that. And he also missed a lot of school because of that. So his mom was trying to, um, you know, educate him with what she knows and she doesn't know anything either, but he was just kind of slow and it would take him like a minute to form a sentence and everything. So they referred to him as their special child kind of stuff, you know, looking at it now, he, he might've been dyslexic or he might've, you know, had a learning disability that wasn't diagnosed, but autistic or something, maybe. Yeah. Um, but because of that, he, he just was kind of left home, left to his own devices. He would go hunting. He ended up for started with the slingshot. So his dad wanted him to be strong. So he'd go out in the swamps and hunt. And then later he bargained with the store owner to, to get, borrow a 22. So he would hunt every day. That's what he would do. He would hunt, he'd get food. That's where the family ate was the hunting from JR. So just like Audie Murphy, that ammo is expensive. If you miss around, you miss eating and you don't have that money. So he gets to be a crack shot with that rifle. And then he's, he's earning money doing that. But he, like I said, because of his education, he quit school in the third grade. So this guy's got a wow. third grade education. He's a sick child. His mom thinks he's special. You odds know. are all stacked against Odds him. are all stacked against this guy. Yeah. So when war comes, um, Pearl Harbor hits. December 7, 1941. America's thrust into this war. Doesn't matter if you're in L.A., Riverside, San Bernardino, or Georgia. It's affecting the whole country, right? So J.R.'s family actually told him, just, just wait for the war to come to you, boy. Like, don't go rushing out. So he doesn't. But he was drafted in 1942. So they don't care if you had pneumonia or you're sickly or you're... you're, you're oh, that you're, wouldn't have mattered, huh? Mm, not so much. I mean, there was guys that were turned away and things like that. But in World War II, I mean, everybody was pretty much going at that point. Right. So he's drafted. He ends up in the um, uh, 33rd Infantry Regiment, which is the Golden Arrow Division. They're another one of those hard-fought World War I, uh, long history of fighting. They're fighting all over the Pacific. When you come from a background like that, is the military probably a blessing in the To in a lot of people regard? it is. And it's funny because you'll hear some guys that are like dying, a lot of like the New York City guys in basic training, and some of the farmers are like, this is the best food I've ever had. Yeah, right. And, That's what I'm and, wondering. Like, we get to sleep until 5 a.m. It's great, you know, because they're <laughs> used to getting up and stuff and like stuff. that. Yeah, so like, you know, like his forebears, like Audie Murphy, like Sergeant York, like all those guys, he's excelling in basic training because he can hit everything with the rifle. So that makes people like him, right? Right. Later on, he actually would train the other troops. He would take them out and help them with their shooting and stuff because he can hit anything because so his life's depended on it since That's he was Audie five Murphy years or? old. No, this is JR. Oh, cool. This is JR. So since he's five years old, his life depended on being able to hit what he sees and being able to hit quick. So and now the things that he er- learned while he was poor, right. just for necessity, exactly. actually make him excel. S- scrapping out a living. But he still, he was a shy, weird kind of a guy, so uh-huh. he didn't have a lot of friends. Um, but they went, he went to basic training, and then they sent him to training in um, California, out in the desert out here. Uh-huh. You, you've been down there? Too? 29? Uh, kind of that area. It's uh, Chiraco, some of the Patton's army and stuff like that. But uh-uh. Didn't you watch the Conscientious Objector? With yeah. Them? Remember when they were talking about how guys were wandering out into the desert? And yes. That's where they're at. Oh, okay. So they're struggling with that. They're living in this miserable heat and things like that. Um, so they all assume they're going to go fight in North Africa. But again, that's not the way the army works. So they ended up sending them to fight in the jungles of the Pacific. And that's why they were dr- desert training? Well, they were desert training. The war moved around a lot. The desert training was, yeah, because we were... The war in North Africa is where we were going to fight. But then we won the war in North Africa, moved to Italy, moved to all these other places. So units are constantly getting okay. shifted. So... But just when you read his letters and stuff like that, yeah. like he was real close with his sister. His sister was, I think, 11 years younger than him, Betty. But she, um, because he was home, he was kind of helping raise her and stuff. So he was real close to her. But his letters, he just, again, he's, he's got like a sweet soul. He's, he's writing, you know, I sure wish I was home and I miss you, family. And tell Betty the silly old rabbits out here are as big as she is and stuff yeah. like that. But he's spelling it out phonetically because he can't 
spell properly because he doesn't yeah. he's got a third grade education just so it's just it sounding it out and it's, yeah. it's almost sad but it's almost endearing because he's not stupid because you, you could tell later in life he clearly wasn't stupid but he just he struggled he had a poor upbringing he had no education he was sick his family was was destitute you know these these people had nothing and if the war hadn't come along they would have continued to have nothing right man America's amazing <laughs> you know yeah, what I mean and, that's, and again like we talked about that's what all these guys are, are going through they're Either, whether they were in the cities or the county or the urban areas or whatever, they all grew up in a, in a real shitty environment, that, that, that um, forge of the 1930s and the Great Depression. And especially back then, man, you go to basic training and you're bunked up with people that right. are from New York. Exactly. And even though they're struggling too, totally different. Yeah, totally different. And probably different. stuff these guys have never seen, like different people that oh, they've yeah. never even... Now with social media, you kind of get like right. a you can kind of see who's who, you exactly. know? Exactly. Back then, I bet it was such a culture shock just to go and meet other people. And there'd be, you know, fist fights and things like that, and people wouldn't, you know, obviously, like, the Texas guys are going to stick together, and the, the you know, the New Yorkers are going to stick together, and the Californios. And God, the, what you a know. tough group of people yeah, that so was, it's, man. Yeah, it's, and imagine that culture shock, because, again, JR, growing up, he wasn't even social with his community that much, right. you know, or in his own family. He was, a, he was, a, everyone knew him as a loner. Like, well, everybody else is out working. He's out in the swamps since he was nine years old by himself every day. You don't, he leaves in the morning, he comes back at night. He leaves in the morning, he comes back at night as a little boy, wow. right? So now he's around all these people. He doesn't even know how to act. And there's pictures of him and you'll see him. He's kind of just looking at everybody like, like he's an outsider almost. Yeah. So they end up getting sent to Hawaii where they do some jungle training and then they go to New Guinea. So the war has already been taking place in New Guinea. Um, we've been fighting for a while, but it's, it's where they're there, they're not in the actual invasion thrust. They're kind of on patrolling duty. There's still a lot of Japanese there. So they end up in this place called Moffin Bay, and they're there for about six months holding this perimeter and doing patrol. So this is almost like an indoctrination into combat for his unit. Yeah. Um, they're, they ha they're having uh, their soldiers killed, but not in high numbers. They're, they're seeing dead enemy Japanese. They're, you know, they're behind the guns. They're, they're dealing with the jungle heat and the jungle sores and all those things like we're talking about. And for JR, it would have been familiar to see, you know, the jungles aren't similar to the swamps, but there's, there's things that are relatable, you know. So he, did he excel? So he, again, he's, he's excelling with his marksmanship and the guys are respecting his abilities, yeah. right? But he didn't have a lot of friends. Um, he couldn't really get into it with people until he became popular using his home skill, Georgia skills again. So we talked about in the other episode, the wreckage of the Japanese ships and the graveyard. Yeah. Well, New Guinea. As you're coming in. Right. New Guinea is a, a wreckage and a graveyard of Japanese planes and American planes and stuff. So one day he's out, there's a, a wrecked Japanese plane sitting there and he's staring at it and everybody's like, what the fuck's wrong with you? You know, like, why are you staring at that? Do you think you're going to fix it or something? So he ends up taking it apart and he makes a moonshine still out of it because he's from oh, the backwoods so of Georgia. so now he's popular. So yeah, so then everybody loved him, right? Because yeah. some of them said it was a little too strong. But, uh, <laughs> but yeah, he actually took the parts of a Japanese plane. He got the coils. He figured it all out. He said, I have everything I need here. And he was able to make these guys liquor. So these guys that have been away from home for over a year, you know, um, are, are fighting, getting a taste of liquor. So now all of a sudden he's a real popular guy. So, you know, that's, that's kind of that bonding that trip, happens man. and that kind of stuff too. And so that's what I'm saying. He's not, just like we've talked about before, somebody who can't read or write great, that doesn't mean they're stupid. It means they can't read or write well. Yeah. You know, this guy can fashion a moonshine still out of pieces of metal that were designed to fly as an aircraft. And he's yeah. able to use his home skills and be able to do that. So that's, that's a pretty cool thing, you know. But just another, like I said, they're not in the most intense combat in, in, uh, in New Guinea, but for six months, they're holding this line. They're doing these patrols. They're living in constant danger, and they're living in constant so fear. So what kind of danger are they? Are they getting in battles or is yeah, it so snipers? There's, there's, or? there's patrols, and it's mostly like snipers. So you'll have little pockets of resistance in the area. So every day they're going out and patrolling, and you know, you'll, you'll take fire, and you'll, you'll return fire, and it's in the jungle, so you may or may not hit anybody. But it's that constant threat, that harassment that, that's going over you, that lure of death that that's hovering above you it can happen at any time you never know are the japanese going to come back and make an offensive this way are they going to are they so similar gone? to like the iraq war in, exactly in, yeah you just you can never let your guard waiting. down or be safe it's it's just a a rough existence and again the area there's if an American goes down, we pick up their body and bury them. But a lot of these Japanese, they would just leave them out there and they would be rotting and they'd be smelling and stuff. So they're, you know, you're in your foxhole and 50 meters to your left, there's a dead, stinking, rotting body that's been there for a long time. So a lot of guys would become real callous to this. Um, you know, you, you, you hate the Japanese so much and you get this, this negative image of them and, you know, screw them anyways and, you know, kick the bodies and things like that. But JR, just as a, a testament to the kind of person he was, in some of the letters he wrote home, he was actually writing with compassion for the Japanese. And one of the things he wrote to his mom was, um, 
It sure seemed bad to die in a place that ain't got no name, but some boys did. Talking about this forgotten campaign, these jungles, these hills that are just meaningless to anybody other than they're just little plots on a map board, but he is recognizing how sad it is. And then he told his mom, I felt bad for them Jap boys when I saw their bodies lying along the trail. No one knows who they are. Their families don't know where they died. This was my enemy, but they were doing their duty like me. So he's able to recognize, again, yeah. despite all the um, you know, righteous propaganda at home, despite all the things he's seen, despite the fear he's seen, he's recognizing them as human beings, which is, I think, a cool part of his character, because not everyone it's does. It's kind of introspective, too. Right. And know? again, that, that guy that spends so much time alone and sees things like that, he's seeing in, he, in a bloated corpse that most people are trying to block out of their mind as being a human being, because that's a coping mechanism, is yeah. to not recognize it as a human. It's an animal, or it's, a, you know, it's the devil, or whatever it is. He's saying, is, that could be me. That's sad. That guy's just doing his job like me, and it's tragic. Like, I feel bad for him. Think, think how introspective that is. I feel terrible for that guy who died in a place that no one knows the name of, no one knows who he is, and their families don't even know where they are. So he's thinking about his own family back home, and he's thinking about these Japanese families. A lot of the troops didn't see the Japanese as people. They saw them as advanced ape men and things yeah. like that. He's picturing a Japanese mother and father at home thinking about their son, not knowing if he's alive or dead, and he knows he's dead on that trail, and that's Probably affecting him. Probably because he hasn't been affected by the social constructs, you know what I mean? Because he <laughs> didn't have a lot of friends. That's and... actually a really good point. Yeah, yeah. He, didn't, he wasn't buying into all of that because yeah. he's just in his own head, you yeah. know, um, it's, it's, it's interesting how people cope and how people deal. And again, to survive in combat, you have to shut off a lot of parts of your humanity. And he didn't. He never did, which I think is, is pretty, pretty cool on That's that. That's awesome, man. Yeah. So they, um, they end up going to Luzon in the Philippines, where um, Ismael Villegas was. Like we yep. talked about, it's that large island. So we're retaking the Philippines. This is huge for um, moral reasons. You know, we, we've, we lost the Philippines in early 1942. We lost. We told the Filipino people, we're going to come back and we're going to save you. Again, we wanted to, some of the commanders wanted to bypass the Philippines, but MacArthur said, absolutely not. We have to take back the Philippines. You know, it's my promise. It's that I shall return. Yep. We will be back. So we landed in... Um, Did MacArthur physically go back? Yeah, he walked yeah. off. There's a, there's a statue of him in the Philippines in oh, the water. Cool. Yeah, he got, the landing craft went down and he marched off into the water, you know, the waist deep water and stuff. Or well, ankle it was still deep dangerous? Water and stuff. Yes, not, not in the middle of the battle, but I mean, there's definitely still pockets of resistance and things like yeah. that. And him and his guys went off. And it's funny to me, if you look at the staff officers, some of them are like obese getting off of him <laughs> and stuff. Yeah, they got no business being So it's there. just more like a to him it symbolism. was important. I get, MacArthur gets a lot of shit and a lot of it's deserved, but MacArthur was a warrior. I don't care what anybody says. He has yeah. the Distinguished Service Cross from World War One. He has Medal of Honor, what, rightly or wrongly, from World War Two. He has a lot of other. He was a warrior and he was he knew damn well what he was doing. So, I think MacArthur would have been happy to die there. I don't think he was. Um, it was definitely political, but I, I mean it was um, well intentioned as well. Yeah. And there's some accounts from ground soldiers saying, you know. We were in the thick of the fight, and you looked over, and MacArthur was calmly on the beach and stuff. So it wasn't all propaganda, because these are letters and stuff, too, that were, yeah. that were written. So, you know. So had he, had he MacArthur not personally pushed to go back, would we have? We could have. By, so there's a, the, pol, uh, the politics of the Pacific and the island hopping campaign go back and forth, because it was the Navy versus the Army and what they wanted to do. So we may or may not have. There's debate on whether or not we needed to land on Iwo Jima, if Iwo Jima was necessary. There's debate on all those islands, because we were doing that island hopping. Mm -hmm. So as, eventually, it was. I think it was necessary. Um, you can't leave that many enemy troops to your rear. But yeah. at the same time, it's like the... We're steamrolling towards Japan. So it's, it's hard to say, and that's a whole nother, you know. But that's really good for the Filipino people, I bet. That was the big thing about yeah. it, is we felt like we had to... They um, put their lives on the line for us. Yes, and they, they fought valiantly the whole, in the fall of Bataan, in the fall of the Philippines. They fought valiantly during the occupation, and they were slaughtered and brutalized for it, and they fought valiantly when we returned. So we owed it to them, and I'm thankful that we, we did yeah. return. Yeah. Man. What a trip, man. So this, so what are they going through at this point? So that's just the lead up. So now we're on Luzon. So again, you're, you're landing. We landed in um, Lingayen Gulf, passing those wreckage of the, the um, ships. The war is going very poorly for Japan and Germany at this point. But again, it doesn't matter if it's the first day of the war or the last day of the war. If you get hit, you're, you're just matter. the same, just the yeah. same dead, right? So all these guys, at least they've had some indoctrination in New Guinea with the, with the enemy, with things like that. But they're still, they're fresh to this type of combat. So they're going to land. They're going to push forward. They're going to push north. Again, 
the Filipino guerrillas are starting to blow up bridges. They're starting to fight the Japanese. They're starting to lure them. We have um, the kamikazes that are, are hitting our ships out in the bay. There's these, these um, strafing going on. There's, there's death and destruction everywhere. There's jungle. This is going to be something completely different than those six months that So they while spent. we're winning over on the other side, the Japanese are still fighting Oh, yeah. They're, brutally. The Japanese fought tenaciously. We've talked about that yeah. in, in several times, too. The Japanese, we would never get, you know, when, when we beat the Germans, we had, what do we do? We got to do something with all these German troops. You don't have to do much with the Japanese troops because there's going to be less than 100 of them because they're going to kill themselves. They're, they're, yeah. they're going to fight to the death and take as many of you can as they can, or they're going to kill themselves. They're, yeah, you showed me that video where it was a crashed Japanese yeah, pilot, pilot mm-hmm. and we're about to pull them in. And he shoots himself right by... He blows ship. himself up. Oh, is that grenade. what it was? Yeah, because they sur- surrender was dishonorable, so they're just not going to do they, it. They're they going to fight it. to the death. Yeah, this is no lip service. They're going to do it. The, the concept of kamikaze, I mean, they're yeah. literally giving their lives. Um, there's no chance of survival once you start down in that Worst plane. kind of enemy, huh? Yeah, exactly. There's nothing you can do but destroy them all, kill them all. Whereas the Germans would felt like they would get overwhelmed and then they could well, the Germans, surrender? The Germans fought a lot, depending on the unit, and depending on, a lot of them fought to the death too, but for the most part, I mean, they were professional soldiers. If they know the end is there, they're going to surrender and they're yeah. going to be POWs and they're going to try to act accordingly or what have you. And obviously there's pockets where they would fight to the death, but for the most part, they fought like westernized um, professional soldiers do. Yeah. So. What a trip, man. You would see some of these actions in Germany, and a few of them would... Remember you would say they would run over a few foxholes, and then the Germans would just put yeah. their hands up. Maybe mm-hmm. they get killed, maybe they don't. Well, at di- different parts of the war, too, you're fighting old men and kids that are being conscripted. I mean, if you look at... I can show you some videos of before the fall of Berlin, when Hitler's out greeting the Hitler's last videotapes uh, footage, he's greeting the soldiers that are going to be defending Europe. And there's 14-year-old kids, and they're bawling their eyes out and stuff, and, you know, they're giving them their, these weapons and equipment and stuff wow. like that, like, defend the fatherland, defend the Reich. And then there's other 14-year-old kids that were gung-ho for it, too, though. My grandpa was part of uh, the liberation of Pilsen in Czechoslovakia, and that's what he said, is a lot of the prisoners that came out were old men and children and stuff, because wow. the, the, most of their good soldier or their of age soldiers were already dead. Damn. So what kind of effect did that have? Like generational uh, for the Germans or yeah, for us? For Germans. Oh, it was horrific. I mean, you, you have, again, we talked about the old guard. Um, they were the veterans of world war one. They've grown up with this. So they're just going to be even more bitter. A lot of the kids, the younger ones, they're going to be um, thankful that the war's over and they saw the, the horrors of it, but, but they lost a lot of Men, right? They lost a generation of men, basically. Yeah, but they, uh, Germany after was pretty happy with us. Part of uh, the fear of the Soviet Union and things like that. And they want to put, they they like, they adopted us pretty quickly and treated us well. So that means that there was something in their heart where they weren't really quite buying into the system or what do you think? Or people just flip flop quickly. Yeah. It's it's kind of hard to say. I mean, look look at the French. They, you know, they hated the Germans and the Germans, while they were occupied, it was things were business as usual. You know, they're drinking right. and having fun with the Germans. And then when the war is over, oh, the Germans were terrible. Yeah. That's a definitely oversimplification. Kind of like which way, but it's kind of, which way most, it goes. most people just go with the prevailing winds. Yeah. Because people are weak hearted. Okay. So JR is ready yeah. to go. Or so what? JR's, yeah. So he's, he's, he was born in 1921. He's about 22 years old at this time. So they find themselves in this place called uh, Dingalan Bay or Dingalan, Dingalan Bay. Uh, probably not pronouncing that right. There's so <laughs> many, so many languages in the Philippines that they are probably not pronouncing yeah. it right. But Ding, I'm going to call it Dingalan Bay. And again, they're kind of on a perimeter duty. So they're set up in this area where his machine gun position is facing out into the bay. So there's, there's a sandbar, um, there's the open water, there's a river on one side, and there's a uh, jungle behind them, right? So they're in this little outpost. So those things you don't think about in the Army, like I talk about, it's not just, oh, I'm going to pick up my rifle and I'll fight the enemy. It's, they're on guard duty. So his guard duty is um, from 2 in the morning to 5 in the morning. That so, sucks. Exactly. But think about the lack of sleep you're going to get, and think about this day after day after day. So from 2 o'clock to 5 o'clock in the morning, you and another guy... You're sitting behind this machine gun. You're just staring out into the darkness. You're you're seeing things. Your your what imaginations. Are you for? Any sign of the enemy? You're expecting an enemy. So you're you're on you're a flank somewhere. Basically, you're tr- the American troops are either pushing forward or they're staying in place. You're the edge of one of our lines. It doesn't matter which one. Are or they how looking for lights? You're probably not lights. You're listening for sounds. You're looking for an actual physical sign of the enemy. You're actually trying to see the enemy. What are you doing to kill time? Nothing. Nothing? Counting. You can't smoke cigarettes or anything, You right? shouldn't. That yeah. cherry on that cigarette. In World War One. they'd say you get two puffs and then you get shot in the face because yeah. that, that, they'll draw a bead on that, that cherry of the cigarette. So some guys will put their ponchos over their head and smoke them and stuff like that. I mean, if you're 
depends on how disciplined you are, but you shouldn't be up talking. You shouldn't be bullshitting. You're supposed to just be staring out into the darkness, right? Um, we could do this too. I mean, in basic training, they showed us a couple things. Um, it was pitch black night. We were out in the field and stuff like that. And they just took us into a field and one of the drill sergeants was like 200 meters away. And uh, he shined his flashlight on and it looked like a freaking airport. And then he turned it off uh, to show you how bad light is, you know. And then he put the red lens over it, which they tell you the red lens will, you know, they won't see you. He shined that, looked like a freaking car. You still see it clear as day. Then he lit a cigarette and you can sit. Like, if there's nothing else out of there, you're going to see it. You know, little sounds like rustling your equipment, shaking your canteen. The enemy will hear it. So you're listening for that on the flip side too. But um so he showed you that to, to make it a, yeah, they, you guys they aware. showed us, it's called noise and light discipline, essentially like, Hey guys, you, you think you're doing the right thing. Cause you're using your red lens. Bullshit. They can still see your red lens. If you light a cigarette there, you, if there's nothing else out there, they can see you from miles away in Vietnam. The enemy could smell cologne. They could smell tobacco. They could smell cause you're in a jungle. Those, those aren't natural smells yeah. and sights and sounds. So if you're walking around being sloppy, you're just might as well be advertising that you're there. What's you know? the deal with the red lens? Um, it's, it's mute, it's mutes the lighting a little bit. If you shine a white lens and then you put a red cover, it's a lot less bright. So it doesn't go as far. It doesn't something. go as far. It's not, it's not picked up as easily. Okay. So what some guys will do is they'll, they'll put a black lens and they'll poke a little pinhole in it. So just a little pinhole of light will come up. But I mean, but when you're on guard duty, that's what you're looking for. You're looking yeah. for, and this is the water, right? So you're listening to the sounds and stuff, but as a, and the ocean's loud. Exactly. You know, but you as ever a, stay down as by a, the beach. Yeah. At night by yourself. Yeah. yeah. When you're on those camps and you hear it, but, um, Think about what the darkness does to a soldier, right? And again, we've talked about your hunger, you're tired, you're fatigued. They've been sleeping in the jungle for months. He hasn't been home in over a year. They're, they're, most guys have lost 20 pounds. You know, they're just lean muscle at this point because they're eating shitty food out of cans, greasy, nasty food. They're never getting enough sleep because, again, they're either on patrol, they're pushing, they're fighting. They landed. They have all this stress. They're probably, you know, having stomach issues and stuff like that right. from fear, from digestion, from all those things. And now... For from two to five in the morning, that three hour block, you're just staring out into the darkness and your mind's just playing tricks on you. You know, you're just you're seeing these phantoms and you're seeing these soldiers and you're probably grabbing the gun and the sweat's going down your face and you're kind of having to remind each other like, hey, it's 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 there's nobody there. Just just hang tight. Yeah. And you know, you'll have a lot of guys just let bursts go into the trees and stuff because they think they see something and then it's nothing or whatever. Right. But it's Man. just it's just, it's a scary existence. And again, and you have a target on you because you're in a machine gun position. Exactly. And that's key to key to this one. So that we got this 30 cal machine gun so just like many 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 nights before though um jr finishes his guard shift so he actually goes back to get some sleep so it's like five in the morning sun's gonna come up in a bit so he he lays down in his little tent thing he's got and he puts his helmet over his head and he kind of cradles his rifle that's another thing we used to do in basic you have to sleep with your rifle because they would tell us the drill sergeants try to steal them they never did but it made you yeah. put it in your sleeping bag with you your friggin' rifle so he's sleeping and he's kind of cradling his rifle and this is uh May 11th, 1945, just for context, the war in Europe's over. The war in Europe ended May 8th, 1945. Is when, when was Germany Diego's? 44? No, he was around the same time. Okay, yeah. so this is around the, the same time. The fall of Philippines, yeah. The fall of the Philippines. So the war in Europe's over. People are over this war. They don't even care anymore. But and They don't even know that there's still some shit right. going on. I mean, they know the war in Japan, but it's kind of like wrap it up. We want to yeah. get back, you know? Yeah. So but that doesn't matter to JR and his guys because they're out there living on the limb. So he lays down in his little hasty position, his little foxhole, and he hears rustling at his tent. So he thinks it's his buddy screwing around. So he says, hey, what are you guys doing? And he stands up, and he's got his uh, helmet on, thankfully, because he was laying it down to keep the sun out of his eyes. And when he opens the tent flap, it's a Japanese soldier that's part of an, uh, an invasion squad. There's a six-man infiltration squad. The Japanese soldier has his samurai sword high above his head. And JR looks up, and the guy comes down, and he slices him across the top of his skull, his uh, and chops the top of his ear off, basically. So essentially, his Dang. his ears hanging. He's in this call. So imagine how tired you are, how dazed you are, how dissolute. You know, you're, you think you were. Is this real? Yeah. And you open. What could be more scary than a Japanese soldier with a sword I above know. his head? Right. So Jr. opens the tent, and immediately this guy comes down and he slices the top of his head and the top of his ear. So Jr. goes into combat mode. Right. Again, if 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 you woke up in your house everyday American, and somebody slashed you, you'd be traumatized for the rest of your life. You'd be in It'd therapy, be, you'd yeah, be done. PTSD. Yeah, you'd just be in a <laughs> shaking shell of a mess. But JR is a soldier in the 33rd Infantry United States Army, 
So he grabs his buttstock and he does what he's trained. He brings it up in a butt, uh, butt smash. He smashes the Japanese soldier under the chin and he drives it down into his head and he beats him to death. So he, as he's beating this Japanese soldier to death, this sergeant who was the leader of this infiltration squad, a second Japanese soldier rushes him. JR picks up his rifle from where he's been beating him and he fires once from the hip and he shoots the Japanese soldier and he kills him. So then as he's doing this, he's literally just woken up out of this, this haze. He's, he's just missing an ear. He's just, well, the, his ear was still intact. Yeah. It was just hanging, <laughs> but uh, he's got an open flesh wound. His head's throbbing. You're feeling that blood. You're feeling that fear. You're trying to figure out what's going on. And then the whole position opens up. You're just hearing chaos. You're hearing guns firing. You're hearing screaming. You're hearing men dying. He looks out and he starts to run. He knows that his principal importance is that machine gun that he just left, right? That machine gun is life or death, like we've talked about a hundred times. That's what's going to protect us. So he's hearing all this shooting, but he's not hearing the machine gun. So he's thinking, what the hell's going on? The two guys relieved me. Where are they, right? So he runs towards the machine gun, and two more of these guys of the six-man infiltration squad rush him, two Japanese soldiers. He's been firing since he was nine years old. So he raises his rifle with two shots, pop, pop, and both of the men go down. He keeps running towards the gun, and he realizes those aren't Americans on the gun. They're two Japanese soldiers that are trying to turn the gun towards the so American they already side. overtook They're the already overtaking the gun. Where are our guys, right? So he immediately kills them, pop, pop, with his two rifle Damn. shots. And then he realizes, shit, I got to get some ammo. I don't have any ammo. The Philippine guerrillas, uh, the Filipino guerrillas that were with us, they actually broke and ran, and they had the ammo with them. So all these guys, they took off because they're not professional soldiers. So he's going, shit, I got to get back to the tent. So he runs towards the ammo tent, and he sees his buddy, uh, Private Caldwell, who's another brave, awesome soldier, but he's, he's scared too. So McKinney tells him, go get ammo, go get ammo. And McKinney, go, uh, J, or, sorry, Colwell tells him, they're going to kill us. We're, we're going to die. And JR's response was, we ain't dead yet. So he tells him, go oh, get the ammo. Awesome. So uh, Colwell starts running and he goes down. He gets hit hard and his, his arm's almost hanging off. He can't um, He, he can't gets hit with the machine He's shot. Uh, we don't know what hit him, yeah. but he's no longer battlefield effective, right? Yeah. But he's alive, and he's going to be one of the witnesses to this action. And that's important because there's several witnesses to this, right? So Colwell goes down, and JR rushes to the gun. He knows he's got to get to that machine gun. So he has his rifle and another rifle, his M1 Garands that we've talked about extensively. And it's morning now? The sun's not up yet. So it's that hazy yeah. time of twilight, right? Or yeah. twilight sundown, So people right? can yeah. see what's so going on. So you're seeing shadows, you're seeing figures, you're seeing chaos, but you're... There's that fog of battle regardless of what time it is, right? Yeah. So there, there's, you know, there's fog, there's smoke, there's, there's, you're right on the bay, you're hearing sounds, you're hearing screaming, you're trying to figure out what's going on. So even in, even in perfect sunlight, even in all that brightness and stuff like that, it's going to be hard to tell what's going on. So he rushes to the machine gun position and he sees the two gunners. You know, he sees the dead Japanese that he just killed and then he sees the Americans. One of them was shot in the head and killed immediately. And when he went down, his partner caught him, the other machine gunner, and he just went into shock. He went into combat shock, basically. And again, this guy's a veteran of multiple campaigns. He's a brave soldier. He's fought well, but he just, he's had too much. So he was laying there, and JR's yelling at him, get, you know, get in the fight, get in the fight. And he's just shaking, I can't, I can't. So JR drags them off, and that's the second witness to this battle, right? Wow. So one's dead, and the other guy just held him the entire time. So JR doesn't have time to, to panic. He doesn't have time to freak out. He doesn't have to time to do anything. He just has time to fight. So he puts his two rifles down against the machine gun, and he starts to go to work on the gun. And when he looks out in the bay, he sees a nightmare. He sees groups of about 30 Japanese and another group of about 30 Japanese. They're moving up on the sandbar. They're moving on the beach, and they're moving towards his position. He doesn't know where any of his friendly troops are. He's literally by himself. He knows Colwell's wounded. He knows the uh, one other man's dead, and he knows the other man is, is trying to to deal with his own demons and and, and he's and holding how many that guys body. should he have on his side well every maybe 50 meters or so there's a foxhole and those guys are there fighting but they can't move it's not like everybody rushed to the machine gun and fight well they have to stay where they are because otherwise you're going to break your perimeter and yeah. he's going to get behind you so they're in their positions and they're doing their jobs but they're spread it's out just focused on his position right and the the filipino gorillas like i said in this instance they 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 ran so JR gets on the gun and he just starts holding down that trigger and he's, he's talking to himself. Um, one of the, the, there's a great book called Phantom Warrior that a lot of this information comes from. And, uh, they, they said that JR told himself, uh, you boys are running into a Georgia cyclone and he just started firing that machine gun and he's watching these waves of troops go down. The Japanese are charging and they're bounding like they're supposed to, but he's firing and he's firing. So he's killing men by the dozens, you know, as he sweeps that machine gun across, the Japanese are falling. Then he'll take fire from the left. So he'll switch over to the beach and he'll mow the enemy down on the left. And then he goes back to the waterline and the water bodies are bobbing in the water at this point, and there's other ones that are moving forward, and he's firing, and he's firing that machine gun, 
and regardless how good and how skilled he is, the Japanese are able to advance towards him, right? And like we talked about, that gun's getting hot. It's firing 550 rounds per minute, yeah. so it's getting too hot, and it's on a fixed um, tripod. So the Japanese get so close that they're too low for him to shoot. Enough. So he grabs the rifles, and he starts firing with those rifles he set up. But even so, the um, uh, Japanese were able to throw grenades. So they threw grenades into McKinney's rifle pit, and the concussion of the grenades blew him back. So he kind of shakes it off. He looks up, and he kills the two Japanese that threw the grenade. He runs back towards the machine gun, and by then, Japanese were all over him. There was about six Japanese that came into the position. But again, that fog of battle, right? They're not trying to kill him. They don't even see him because they just saw him go down with grenades. Yeah. So they start grabbing the gun. They're almost, trying, they're almost ignoring this American body there that just killed 30-plus people, and they're trying to turn that machine gun in, right? So JR grabs his... Um, his rifle, and I'm sorry, there was only about, uh, this was two specific Japanese that were on the gun. He butt strokes one and he starts, beats this man to death with his rifle, and then he grabs the gun, and he's fighting like a tug of war with this Japanese until he realizes, I gotta do something, but this chaos and this confusion, so he grabs his knife and he stabs the Japanese soldier through the throat and he kills him. And again, this is this, Damn. This, is this Georgia farm boy that we've been talking about that has so much compassion for these guys, and he's, he doesn't want to be there, right? Yeah. He's sick. His mom thought he was a special boy, and they didn't want him to go fight because they didn't think that he was going to be. Yeah, so he's, he's in this hole fighting for his life. He's in this Japanese machine gun position. One of the Japanese soldiers actually hits him with a wooden spear, hits him in the ear, the same side that he's oh, been slashed on and stuff, right? So um, he ends up beating him to death as well. So he's fighting with his hands. He's fighting with his buttstock. He's fighting with bayonets. How he's many kills his, does he have at this point? Uh, well, we'll get to his, his kill count after, but it's, it's just chaos at this point, right? Single-handedly. Single hand, literally single-handedly. There's a wounded man that's watching this, that's, that's coming in and out of consciousness, going, oh my God, this one, this is amazing, but two, that's the only thing that's saving me right now. And then there's another guy that's just in shell shock. He's lucid, but he can't do anything. He's just sobbing like a baby. Yeah. He's, he's combat ineffective at this point, right? But then there's JR, who's just fighting for his life. He's just, he's just in a fury. He's, he's swinging his buttstock. He's stabbing with a bayonet. He's stabbing with his knife. He's shooting with that rifle. Every time, every time he raises his rifle, Someone's going to die because he knows how to shoot, and now his life's on the line. He's so good with his M1 that he's trained other soldiers how to shoot this M1, right? And now these poor Japanese soldiers don't know what yeah. they're running into. <laughs> they're running into this guy. So he gets back on the gun, and he's firing at these waves and waves of men, right? Just bodies. Now, psychologically, imagine that effect that that has on you, right? So he's feeling this, too. He's not... Rambo, he's a poor George boy who doesn't want to fucking kill anybody, but yeah. he has to kill them. So he's just mowing these guys down until his machine gun jams. So now the gun's jammed. Grenades start coming in. Another Japanese grenade hits him and throws him back. It doesn't get any shrapnel in his body, but it shreds one? his clothes. This is the second grenade attack that he's, he's actually hit on. A Japanese jumps in the trench, and he stabs at him with the bayonet. He actually bayonets through his clothes, but he misses him. JR grabs the guy's rifle and starts beating him with his fists, like a, you know how Americans fight. So he's grabbing onto the rifle, and he's punching him. He ends up biting the soldier's hands, taking the rifle from him, and beating him to death. So imagine this... Holy frenzied crap. chaos chaos we've talked about um, he's berserkers beat three people to death he's he's beat more than three people to death at this wow. point um and and they're still coming they're just coming and if he stops if he gives up if he dies if he lays down if he runs everybody everybody dead. behind him is going to be compromised potentially killed right the japanese are going to overrun this position because this is their choke point this is that fatal funnel that they're coming through the only thing standing between this horde of invading enemy and your friendly guys and your wounded guys and your your people in the rear that are fighting too but it's their backs because they're positioned in different positions i'm sorry face different positions the only thing that's stopping them is this sickly georgia boy who's been hunting all his life and has been a loner, right? Yeah. So um, Now he's back in that lone position. Now he's back in that lone position. So again, he looks up. He's covered at this point in his own blood. His head wound is throbbing. He doesn't know if his ear's there. He doesn't know how bad his head is. He doesn't know if he's, he doesn't know if he's skulls wounded. cracked. He's got uh, grenade shrapnel has ripped up his clothes. His clothes are hanging on in rags. He's got blood of other people. His fists are probably busted from punching people. His teeth are hurting. He's tired. He's, he's freaking out. And now he, the Japanese just filled the hole. So now they overcome, right? Because that machine gun jammed so he could no longer hold the waves off. So now at this point, 
he looks up again, and they think he's dead in that fog of battle, and he sees eight Japanese. That's where I got the number from. I got ahead of myself. There's eight Japanese in the hole, and they're fighting for the gun. They almost look like they're fighting each other. They're, they're trying to turn this gun in. They don't know that the gun's jammed. It's no longer operable, but JR picks up his rifle butt, and he just starts swinging. He swung, and he hit, started, he's crushing these guys' skulls. He's hitting them in the head, and this isn't there's witnesses to this, and there's documentation after, just so you don't think this is yeah. all hyperbole and bullshit. He started swinging, and, t- and every time he'd swing, he would hit, and he'd just swing and swing and swing some more. And again, in this fog of battle, the Japanese don't even realize what's going on. They're just getting attacked by this ghoul, this zombie, this phantom, yeah. as the name of the book, The Phantom Warrior. He swung until his rifle broke. He hit the Japanese in the head so far hard that the rifle broke. By the end of it, there was dead eight dead Japanese that he had killed in this fury of um, swinging, swinging this, this just, um, they, there's, there's a quote that my rifle's not my weapon. I'm the weapon. My rifle's only the tool. JR's the weapon at this point. Anything yeah. he picks up, he's going to go to town with. So then he realizes, I can't defend this position anymore. There's too many Japanese. They're going to kill me. So he grabs his rifle and he sprints into the wood line or what we call the wood line. He sprints into the jungle. The Japanese don't know that the gun is dead, though, right? So they see this gun. They're charging forward, and all they want is that gun. So they're not so, even focused on it. Right. Him. So JR is now in a position of advantage in the wood line. No one knows he's there. I'm calling it the wood line, but it's the jungle. No one knows he's there. No one's after him. No one's rushing him like the machine gun, and he's a marksman. So every time one of those Japanese soldiers pops up, he puts him down, oh and they don't know where gosh. it's coming from. And we talked about the swamps earlier and stuff, and in the book Phantom Warrior, which i uh, got to give a shout-out because I got a lot of my info from there. That's his he, book? Uh, it's a book about him. Wow. He didn't write it. Uh, obviously. Yeah. Um, but uh, one of the things the author mentioned was when he was a little kid, when he was in the swamps of Georgia, one day he saw a bobcat and he, he had always seen bobcat tracks, but he had never seen the bobcat and, because they're so elusive. And he thought like, oh, this is crazy. This thing's letting me see it. And then it disappeared. And he's looking around and then he sees it on the other side of him. And then he's looking around and he sees it again. And he's like, well, how the hell is this thing doing this? And he realized it only lets him see it when he wants to see it. And eventually he realized, he's thinking, why is this bobcat letting me see it? And then he finally sees the bobcat's baby after it's getting out of sight and then the bobcat leaves. He was showing himself to take JR's attention oh, and then wow. to, so he could escape, Distraction. right? So JR remembers that and he's doing the same thing, right? So he'll pop up and fire, pop, pop, and then he gets down and then he goes somewhere else and pop, pop, and he fires again. So he just keeps firing and he keeps firing. At one point, he actually... Um, Friendly reinforcements finally arrive, and they just see mounds of bodies. They see a pile of bodies by the machine gun. They see a pile of bodies on the sandbar. They see bodies on the beach. They see all these people, and they assume the whole unit's done it, but it was just JR, right? So when friendly reinforcements get there, JR doesn't lay down. He immediately runs back to the two, the one dead and the one wounded guy because he knows that they're going to get killed. He starts dragging them, and he actually he puts a bush over them to try to hide them. <laughs> sure enough, Japanese soldiers start rushing the position, so he kills them. He kills two more Japanese soldiers who are attacking them, and um, Colwell's still watching all of this, right, just, just in shock, oh my and then gosh. he finally sees JR's running, and JR finally goes down. So he looks at him, and he's thinking, you know, again, there's our hero, but, but JR's not dead. He just has an adrenaline dump, right? So, you know, we've talked about it with athletes and we've talked about all those things and yeah. stuff like that. So he, he, he hits the dirt and he starts shaking uncontrollably and then he starts laughing and then he starts bawling his eyes out and he's just crying because he's, he's gone through so much. And Colwell quoted, was quoted as hearing him say, God, make him stop. Tell him, God, they're all going to die. Please, God, make him stop. <laughs> <laughs> he's not afraid for himself. He knows if they come out, he's going to kill him. <laughs> Holy <laughs> and he doesn't want to kill anybody. So he's crying. He's, he's maniacal. He's crying. Make them stop. I don't, I don't want to kill, kill them, but I'm going to, <laughs> right? <laughs> Okay, it's my new favorite, too. Yeah, so he's, I just think he's awesome. So then the sun, the sun finally comes up, and, and these, um, I think his name was Red Barrett, and uh, some of these other, yeah, Red Barrett, some of these other soldiers are looking around, but the fight's not over. The Japanese are still coming, so they start seeing a mortar crew set up, right? And mortars are devastating. We've yeah. talked about that, right? So sure enough, JR raises his rifle, two shots, pop, pop. He shoots the mortarman through the head and kills him, but that um, mortar... Was, was already launched. So the mortar throws JR. Again, he's hit, but he's not wounded. He's just thrown back from the concussion. And then he stands up and he begins firing uh, his rifle. Where's my quote? He fires his rifle. He's, he's, he's still fighting. One of the uh, Colwell um, is seeing this and he, he literally thinks that McKin- McKinney should be dead. He's seen him die basically multiple times, right? Yeah. But he's not going down. Let me, let me find my quote here. He's still um, able to fight, and he, he, by all accounts, should be dead at this point, right? One Damn. Second. 
Yeah, because this dude is laying there with his arm ripped off, just seeing this phantom friend who probably he never knew had this kind of courage exactly. or this kind of ability. Exactly. So I, I can't find the quote. I had it printed out. But it's, um, he basically said that he saw McKinney standing there. He didn't look like he was breathing. His eyes were red, and there was smoke all around him. So he looks like a demonic face. Yeah. He said he doesn't even look like he's, he's just in combat mode. He's, there's smoke from the mortars and the grenades and the combat and the, the, you know, the guns that are, oh that are, that are steaming and everything like that. And McKinney's just standing there firing. There's still enemy coming, and he's still firing. A machine gun crew sets up, and, and McKinney kills them both. Right, so that's the last of this these enemy troops that are uh, that are finally coming. I'm going to find that quote as soon as I, I stop looking for it. Yeah. I'm sure, obviously. Um, so then, the battle's finally dead. Right, the battle's finally over. Jr. stops it, and he finally collapses from exhaustion, from fear, from from fatigue, from everything. He How long finally, did it go? So it was Jr.'s one man battle was about 40 minutes long. So wow. all this was happening. They, if you break it down, he killed someone about every 30 seconds. Um, all this fanatical fury, again, of a guy that should be sleeping. When you get off night shift and you go to bed, yes. and now you get slashed in the air. So all of this happens, and then he, he's finally able to collapse. Um, one of the sergeants comes up, and this is where, again, this sounds fantastical. A lot of it sounds like it's anecdotal and it's bullshit, but this is very well documented because all these people that came up were looking around and going, oh, my God, what the, what the hell happened? And um, one of them asked... Who did all this? Like, where? Who did this? And somebody said they were all. That was McKinney. McKinney did this. This is all McKinney. And McKinney's first response was, "Red got six of them himself. <laughs> like, <laughs> like you just killed a hundred guys." And immediately he's trying to push credit to this other wow. guy, right? So, um, yeah, the sergeant, the sergeant who um, found him sitting there after he had surveyed the scene and after he had talked to other people and seen it. So he comes up, kind of in shock, to McKinney, and he says, "How many? How many do you think you killed?" And McKinney's crying at this point. So he said he wiped his tears away, you know, his hands covered with blood and grime. And he says, about 100. I lost count, maybe 20 or 30 more. And then he tells the sergeant, excuse me, sir, but I think you better get down. Or excuse me, sergeant, you better get down. And the sergeant says, there ain't no more Japs coming today, Mac. You killed them all. <laughs> <laughs> so, Holy um, crap, dude. And then uh, a different sergeant actually tried to take pictures of the bodies and stuff, but the, they have the pictures, but they're real shitty because the, they were developed poorly because of the humidity and everything like that in the Pacific. But in his uh, diary, he wrote, the sergeant wrote, 95 killed on the sandbar, plus 42 around a machine gun placement. Those nips all belong to Mac. So he killed 95 on the sandbar between his machine gun strafing, between hitting him with the rifle, between Dude. running back and forth, and then 42 around the machine gun. That includes those he killed with his rifle, killed with his bayonet, killed with his foot. Another soldier... Afterwards, wrote, in, wrote down um, when they, they went out to search the bodies for intelligence. Searching the bodies for documents, we found many cracked skulls and body contusions where McKinney's rifle butt and kicking feet had done their work. So just a furious... So oh they're not finding... Gosh. You find bodies and different states in, in different states of the battle. Early, you'll find single wounds. Later, you'll find grievous wounds. You know, they're finding cracked skulls. No bullet wounds. They're finding cracked skulls. They're finding bruises. They're finding smashed faces because McKinney's fighting with teeth and nail. He's a primal warrior at this point. He's using a machine gun. He's using a rifle. He's using a bayonet. He's using his teeth. He's using his hands. He's using his feet. Whatever he has available to him, right? Dang. So this wasn't one of those where there was any doubt. Yeah. <laughs> they, they immediately, one of the, another one of the officers said, uh, I need to report this right away. I think this is some kind of record, basically, right? Yeah. Um, so they ended up pulling him off the line. Um, he uh, was actually given like a bodyguard so he wouldn't die. They were trying to keep him out of combat and stuff. And he ended up being obviously awarded the, the uh, Medal of Honor. He got malaria in the Pacific afterwards. Or they diagnosed him with malaria, which there's a very good chance he had malaria during the battle too. Yeah. Because they didn't catch it till after. And malaria makes you sick and weak. So there's a good chance that he had this, these fever chills during the battle, which would make him so much more weak. At one point in the battle, he actually tried to pick up the machine gun, which is 40 pounds or so, and he couldn't do it. He didn't have the strength to do it, that physical Damn. strength, because he was weak yeah, and exhausted. fighting hand-to-hand. <laughs> exactly. Um, but he was, he was so... Again, the machine gun wasn't the weapon that day. The rifle wasn't the weapon that day. McKinney was the weapon that day. He would have picked That's up rocks and stones. Man. Yeah, and just a little teeny humble guy. And later in life, he said, sometimes I still hear the screams them Jap boys when they were coming at me. So he never lost his humanity and he never lost his compassion. He felt so terrible about having to do that. He was, he was always shy to 
the the credit and the the adulations and things like that. He was given his Medal of Honor by Harry Truman in uh, 1946, and Truman said what he always says: "I'd rather have this than than yeah. you know be the president of the United States and things like that." But um, McKinney just he stayed a humble country country guy. He got a farm. He lived with his family. You know he. Um, uh, he ended up dying in 1997. I think he had. An, oh wow, uh, he lived a long life. Yeah, he lived. He lived a good life. I think he might have died of pneumonia. It's just you know illness. He was 76 years old when he died, but um, stayed that that just simple country boy. You know, had the war not come along, he would have been a sharecropper son his whole life. He would have been more than happy to live in the swamps and the uh, hunting in the swamps of Georgia and you know living living a farmer's lifestyle. But these cataclysmic events that affected everyone threw him into this, this hellscape of battle, and he not only rose up to be a soldier, but he killed over 100 men single-handedly. And there's, there's two eyewitnesses that saw the whole thing. There's Colwell, and there's the uh, shell sock soldier, and then there's dozens and dozens of guys that came afterwards. There's Red Barrett, who saw the finality of the onslaught, where he's seeing McKinney kill the machine gun crew. He's seeing McKinney kill the mortar man. He's seeing McKinney firing. He's seeing McKinney dragging Jesus. bodies and putting bushes. All these things. And McKinney, he's not tiny, but he's, he's my size. He's about 5'8", yeah. 5'9", five, five, um, you know, 140 pounds. He's, he's going to be, I'm more than that now, but you know, back yeah. in the day, he's, he's um, lost some weight to sickness and things like that, but he's not a huge dude. Of course, the Japanese were a lot smaller, but he's literally... You can't be in a more hellacious fight than McKinney yeah. was in. And nobody even knows McKinney's name. You know, you remember That's some of the bigger ones, but man. you don't remember his. How right? is that one not like? I don't know, man. Whoa. And so let's read his official citation. So um, just like uh, Desmond Doss, they actually lowered the numbers to make it believable because they didn't think anyone believe, would believe it. Really? Right. It's, um, they actually, so the bodies that were in the water, they didn't give them credit for, basically. They were like, well, we can't count those and stuff. So they counted the ones around the machine gun. But without further ado, here's uh, there we go, here's J R McKinney's uh, citation. So all the citations also just for they they'll usually start with like name, rank, yet um, place of the sign. I usually just start with the narrative. Yeah. So this one starts. He fought with extreme gallantry to defend the outpost which had been established near Dingolan Bay. Just before daybreak, approximately a hundred Japanese stealthily attacked the perimeter defense, concentrating on a light machine gun position, having completed a long. I'm sorry concentrating on a light machine gun position. Having completed a long tour of duty at his gun, Private McKinney was resting a few paces away when an enemy soldier dealt him a glancing blow on the head with the saber. <laughs> That's insane. Although dazed by the stroke, he seized his rifle, bludgeoned his attacker, and shot another assailant who was charging him. Meanwhile, one of his comrades at the machine gun had been wounded, and his other com uh, companion withdrew, carrying the injured man to safety. Alone, Private McKinney was conf confronted by 10 infantrymen who had captured the machine gun with the evident intent of reversing it to fire into the perimeter. Leaping into the emplacement, he shot seven of them at point-blank range and killed three more with his rifle butt. In the melee, the machine gun was rendered inoperative, leaving him only his rifle with which to meet the advancing Japanese, who hurled grenades and directed knee mortar shells into the perimeter. He warily changed positions, secured more ammunition, and reloading repeatedly cut down waves of the fanatical enemy with devastating fire or clubbed them to death in hand-to-hand -hand combat. When assistance arrived, he had thwarted the assault, and he was in complete control of the area. Not we were or they were. Yeah. He was in complete control of the area. 38 dead Japanese lay around the machine gun and two more at the side of the mortar, 45 yards distance, was the amazing toll he had exacted single-handedly. By his indomitable spirit, extraordinary fighting ability, and unwavering courage in the face of tremendous, tremendous odds, Private McKinney saved his company from possible annihilation and set an example of unsurpassed intrepidity. Damn. So even there, even with the um, minimizing and stuff, they're still giving him credit for, for 40 bodies there, right? And again, they're not giving him credit for the ones that were on, on the beach and that were in the water. Yeah. And I, I, I found the quote from uh, oh, okay, Colwell. Cool. So it says... He did not seem to be breathing, and his eyes were red and glaring. Smoke was all around his legs. I just, I love that yeah. vision. And again, you'll see this, this, this small country guy, just a demon. And the, the book, they call it Phantom Warrior because they're claiming that they, they heard the Japanese yelling uh, the Japanese word for phantom, thinking he was a ghost because he wouldn't go down. But I don't know how much of that is you yeah. know, here or there, if they could translate that after. But just that image, again... This small guy, he's hit by grenades twice, and he doesn't receive a scratch from him. He gets back up. The mortar knocks him back. He gets back up. The Japanese are in hand-to-hand -hand combat. If you're cold while you're watching him fighting and then going down with bodies and then him popping back up, 
I mean, Jesus, that's just, it's just, that is insane. It's, it's a testament to the, the will to survive, human fury, and what you can do when you're determined. Right? American spirit. There you go, man. Yeah. That's, that's, he's literally born from the freaking. He grew up, he's raised from the mud of the South. Yeah. He's spawned from the, the, the swamps and the farm and the cotton fields, and he's grew to be a, a weapon that, single-handedly saved a company of man. Who didn't even know he was a weapon. He didn't even know he was a weapon. And he's yeah. got a third-grade education. He's got all the odds against him. He could have died. And again... Maybe he, they're not against him. Maybe when you live a simplistic <laughs> that's actually existence a really good like point. that, yeah. you're just closer to your carnal he's, spirit. He's you know? been fighting his whole damn life. That's what I mean. Yeah. It's just, you know, when you busy up your life with... Simpli- or with uh, I don't know, man. How, I don't know what the word is, but, you know, like convenience. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Maybe I mean, it just, just softens the spirit. I can't walk a couple miles without getting, you right. know, yeah. And everything he does is hard. And think about, again, uh, an eight-year-old boy, his pneumonia so bad, he's, he can't breathe, so the country doctor comes over and just slices his back open and sticks it. You know, there's no, there's yeah. no antibiotics, there's no anesthetics, there's no anesthesia, there's no nothing. They're just hold still and cut him open, you know, and, and to drain his lung and things like that and to to deal with that recovery and, and it's just it's it's definitely going to give him some toughness right yes. it's going to break you or, or make you stronger wow man that was crazy so that's, that's my new favorite one. yeah so we'll see if we can beat that one but he's definitely one of my friends yeah, that's going to be hard but that's my goal now is J. to find, R. find some other McKinney. ones yeah they called him mac uh, they called him jr his name was john but just yeah. a shy country boy Awesome, man. What a great story. Yeah. Testament to the American spirit. Right on. So. Yeah. You guys have any questions? Hit them in the comment section. Like, subscribe. And the most important thing, just share the show with your friends if you can to keep these stories going. Uh, we'll be back next week. You got anything? Nope. Thanks for you guys that are listening. Um, got a couple people out there that are, are repeatedly giving us the comments and the shares and stuff like yeah. that. We really appreciate it. Yep. So, All right, know, guys. Try to keep giving you good content. Yep. We'll be back next week. Thanks again. <laughs> <laughs>